assassination and the risk thereof are an occupational hazard for the prominent, the powerful or just the plain famous and popular, the murder of such people can have an outsized impact, sometimes altering the trajectory of history, and producing results that shape events for centuries. Following are 20 things about historic assassination plots, some successful others not. The Puerto Rican Seeds of an Assassination Plot Against Harry S. Truman Assassination has claimed the lives of four American presidents, and several other commanders-in-chief have escaped attempts on the lives. One of the latter was Harry S. Truman, who survived a now largely forgotten assassination attempt by Puerto Rican nationalists who sought to draw attention to their cause by killing a sitting U.S. president. Today, the question of Puerto Rico's ties to the U.S. revolves around whether it should join the country as a new state or remain an American territory. However, there was once significant support within Puerto Rico for a third option, outright independence. Failure to secure that goal eventually set pro-independence activists on the path of political violence. The Puerto Ricans who lobbied for independence, with the pen and with the sword. In 1922 the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, PRNP, was formed, to lobby for independence by both the pen and sword. Decades later, the pen had not brought about independence. So frustrated PRNP activists, led by the party's charismatic leader, the Harvard-educated Pedro Albizu Campos, came to favor the sword. On October 30, a series of coordinated armed attacks struck American targets in six Puerto Rican towns, the uprising was swiftly crushed by a strong military response that included the use of planes. President Harry S. Truman described the event as an incident between Puerto Ricans that further upset PRNP activists. To draw attention to the cause of independence and make a point that what had happened was a rebellion, an act of war between two countries, they drew plans for the assassination of Truman. Planning the Assassination of President Truman The failed uprising in Puerto Rico frustrated PRNP activists. In the Bronx two Puerto Rican nationalists, Oscar Colazo and Griselio Torresola, were further angered by what they saw as excessive force by the U.S. military to beat back the rebels. So they decided to retaliate and draw attention to their cause with an assassination of the American president. At the time Truman was not living in the White House, which was undergoing a renovation, but in the nearby and less secure Blair House, Torresola, an experienced gunman, secured a Walter P-38 pistol and a German Luger, and taught the less experienced Colazo how to load and handle them. The duo then caught a train from NYC to Washington, D.C. to reconnoiter. On November 1, 1950, they sprang into action. The Attempted Assassination of Harry S. Truman While President Truman was napping in the Blair House, Griselio Torresola approached the building from the west side. His partner, Oscar Colazzo, snuck up behind a Capitol Police officer, Donald Birdsell, who was standing on the Blair House's steps, and tried to shoot him in the back. However, the inexperienced Colazzo had failed to chamber a round. He did so and fired just as Birdsell turned around and hit him in the knee. Hearing the gunshots, Secret Service agent Vincent Mraz rushed out of a separate Blair House entrance and shot Colazzo in the chest as he was climbing the steps. Two other Secret Service agents joined in and exchanged fire with Colazzo in what was described as the biggest gunfight in Secret Service history. In the meantime, Torresla had reached a guard booth and shot White House police officer Leslie Coffelt four times, mortally wounding him. Would be assassin brought down by a dying man. After mortally wounding officer Leslie Coffelt, Torresla shot another officer, Joseph Downs, in the hip, back and neck. Despite his injuries, Downs managed to lock the door, denying the attacker's entry into the Blair house. Torresla then joined Colazzo in his firefight and shot officer Donald Birdsell in the knee. As the gunfight raged, President Truman stuck his head out of a window, just 30 feet away to see what was going on. As Secret Service agents shouted at the president to get away from the window, Officer Leslie Coffold, who had been shot by Torresla and lay dying, managed to prop himself against the guard booth, taking aim he fired on Torresla from 30 feet away, and shot him in the heat, killing him instantly. Coffold was rushed to the hospital, but died of his wounds four hours later. Oscar Colazzo survived his injuries to be tried, convicted and sentenced to death. Truman commuted his sentence to life in prison. The African Conqueror Who Created a Tribal Empire Truman was an example of a lucky leader who escaped assassination, many others were not so fortunate. 
One such was Shaka Zulu, a warrior who rose from humble origins to become chief of his tribe, then launched a ruthless campaign of conquest against other southern African tribes. A military visionary, he revolutionized tribal warfare, bringing it to a hitherto unprecedented pitch of destructiveness. By the time he was done, he had established a Zulu empire. He overcame all before him, except an assassination plot that brought him down at the height of his power. When Shaka came to power, tribal warfare in southern Africa was a low-intensity affair, it was dominated by rituals and display, with relatively little actual fighting, and thus few fatalities. Shaka was of a bloody-minded bent, and he set about changing that. He introduced fighting formations, organized his men into regiments known as impis, and transformed the Zulus into a disciplined army. Shaka Zulu was assassinated by his own brothers. Shaka abandoned the throwing spears used in the region for centuries, instead he trained his men to use short stabbing spears, emphasizing shock tactics and decisive close combat. Zulu tactics and training made them unstoppable, triggering a catastrophe known as the Mfakane, meaning the crushing or forced migration. Tribes fleeing Shaka's onslaught were forced to encroach upon their neighbors, who were then forced to fight or become refugees, encroaching upon their neighbors in turn, in a cascade of violence that killed millions. Shaka's rule finally came to an end in 1828, that year he sent a regiment raiding up to the borders of the Cape Colony, but when it returned, rather than allow it the customary rest, he ordered it on yet another raid. That and increasingly megalomaniacal behavior led to widespread grumbling. Taking advantage of that, Shaka's half-brother Dingane organized an assassination plot. At a signal one day at camp, he and his co-conspirators suddenly fell upon Shaka, and stabbed him to death. The assassination that ushered the fall of the Roman Republic. During the Roman Republic, Rome's legions were originally drawn from those who could afford to arm and equip themselves, mostly a middle class of independent farmers. However, the independent farmer class steadily shrank over the generations as public lands were illegally seized and consolidated into vast estates controlled by the patrician senatorial classes. In addition to illegality, those large estates worked by massive slave gangs drove small farmers off their lands and into poverty, diminishing the pool of prospective legionaries. Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus was a Roman tribune of the plebes, and a popularis politician a faction that supported plebeians against the conservative, aristocratic patricians, whose faction was known as the Optimates. He sponsored agrarian reforms to help small independent farmers, who were being driven into extinction by the concentration of public lands into illegal giant estates, controlled by a small elite of the patrician senatorial class, that led to his assassination, and set the stage for a spiral of political violence that caused the collapse of the Roman Republic. The Assassination of a Tribune, a Roman at first Tiberius Gracchus proposed to break the giant estates owned by the rich, and redistribute the lands in small parcels to lower-class Romans, he was vehemently opposed by the senatorial class. When he pushed through legislation that began redistributing land, his political rivals plotted an assassination to get rid of him. He was murdered by a senatorial mob during a riot, organized by conservative optimates seeking to limit the power of the popular assemblies and the tribunes, while extending that of the pro-aristocratic senate. The assassination was the Roman Republic's first act of organized political violence. It broke a double taboo, that against political violence in general, and that against visiting violence upon a tribune of the plebes, whose persons had been deemed inviolate for centuries. Tiberius Gracchus' cause was carried on by his younger brother Gaius. He met a similar fate. Younger brother follows his older brother's lead, and shares his fate. Tiberius Gracchus' younger brother Gaius Sempronius Gracchus, followed in his older brother's footsteps, he became a tribune of the plebes, a popularis politician advancing the cause of the plebeians, and an advocate of agrarian reform. He also followed his older brother's footsteps and became a victim of political violence, when the conservative Roman Senate and the Optimates plotted his assassination. Gaius Gracchus was elected a tribune of the plebes in 123 BC. He used the popular assemblies to push through his brother's agrarian reforms and advocated other measures to lessen the power of the senatorial nobility. He also pushed through legislation to provide all Romans with subsidized wheat. He was re-elected tribune in 122 BC. In 121 BC, the Senate again organized a riot to go after a turbulent tribune. After one of his supporters was killed, Gaius Gracchus and his followers retreated to the Aventine Hill, the traditional asylum of plebeians in an earlier age, the Senate ordered Rome's consuls to go after Gaius Gracchus, 
which they did with a mob. 11. Assassination temporarily solved a problem for Rome's conservatives, but backfired on them big time. Rome's conservatives plotted Gaius Gracchus' assassination, but he spared them the trouble by committing suicide. When the situation became hopeless, the mob then massacred hundreds of his followers and threw their bodies into the Tiber River. In the long run, the murders of the Gracchi brothers backfired upon the Optimates and the patrician class. The patricians were virtually exterminated during rounds of proscriptions that claimed the lives of thousands. First the dictator Sulla went after Popularis following his victory in Rome's first civil war, and murdered them by the thousand in terrifying proscriptions. The conservative victory was not permanent, however, a generation later the pendulum swung when Octavian and Mark Antony went after the Optimates in an even bloodier, and more thorough proscription following their victory in a civil war against Julius Caesar's assassins. Then Octavian ended the Roman Republic, and replaced it with the Roman Empire, which he ruled as its first emperor with the title Augustus. What remained of the patrician class was gradually killed off, as they were caught up in or were falsely accused of conspiracies against various emperors, until they became virtually extinct. A well-timed assassination that relieved the allies of a headache. Admiral Francois Darlin was commander-in-chief of the French Navy at the start of World War II. After France's defeat in 1940, he served in the collaborationist Vichy regime, rising to become its deputy leader. He was in French North Africa when the Allies invaded in 1942, and they cut a deal with him to get him to order the forces, under his command to lay down their arms. In exchange, the Allies allowed Darlin to govern French North Africa, and West Africa under Vichy's policies. That agreement became a diplomatic, and public relations embarrassment for the Allies, the agreement set up Darlin, with his pro-Nazi record, as a rival of the Free French under Charles de Gaulle, who had never stopped fighting the Nazis. The embarrassment was finally lifted by a fortuitous assassination, when Darlin was killed on Christmas Eve, 1942 by an odd duck named Fernand Bonnier de La Chapelle. The man who carried out the assassination of Darlin the assassination of Admiral Darlin was carried out by Fernand Bonnier de La Chapelle. La Chapelle was born in 1922 to a journalist father, who dreamt of restoring the French monarchy, and combined that with ardent anti-fascism. After France's defeat in 1940, the younger La Chapelles came to hate the Vichy regime, which collaborated with the fascists. Soon as the Allies landed in North Africa, La Chapelle joined a resistance group. The resistance group loathed Darlin as a symbol of everything Vichy, and resented his continued hold on power, so they began planning his assassination. Lots were drawn to determine who would do the deed, and La Chapelle won. So he secured a pistol, received absolution from a priest, and went looking for Darlin on December 24, 1942. He waited in the hallways of the Summer Palace in Algiers, and when Darlin showed up, La Chapelle shot him twice. He was tried by a French military court the following day, and was convicted and sentenced to death. Darlin's assassin went before a firing squad thinking it was going to be a sham execution. Fernand Bonnier de La Chapelle was not too perturbed by his death sentence, he was confident that he would get a stay of execution, or at worst, that there would be a sham execution, in which the firing squad would be issued blanks instead of real bullets. As it turned out, La Chapelle did end up getting pardoned and rehabilitated by an appellate court, which ruled that his assassination of Darlin had been justifiable because it was done in the interest of the liberation of France. However, that ruling was handed down in December of 1945, three years too late for La Chapelle, who was executed by a firing squad that used real bullets on December 26, 1942, one day after he was sentenced to death. Ever since there has been plenty of speculation that Darlin's assassination had been engineered by Allied intelligence. The theory is that they got a patsy to pull the trigger, promising him a pardon, then swiftly executed him to silence him for good. The Assassination of Our Man in Saigon The Republic of South Vietnam's President Ngo Dinh Diem came to power in 1955. He did so with a heavily rigged referendum that deposed Vietnam's Emperor Bao Dai, and established the Republic of Vietnam with himself as its president. A staunch Catholic, he pursued discriminatory policies that favored Catholics, for public service and military positions, land distribution tax concessions and business arrangements. Some Catholic priests even ran private armed militias, which they put to use demolishing Buddhist pagodas and forcing people to convert, 
activities to which the government turned a blind eye, since Catholics were a distinct minority in the country, and about 90% of South Vietnamese were Buddhists, Diem's pro-Catholic tilt did not sit well. Things would get bad, and end up with his assassination. Act of self-immolation that highlighted the unpopularity of our man in Saigon. Things kept going from bad to worse in South Vietnam. By 1963 the country was seething with discontent and a steadily intensifying insurgency, fueled by widespread governmental corruption, nepotism and the president's pro-Catholic policies. Protests erupted in May, when Diem's government banned the flying of Buddhist flags, only days after it had encouraged Catholics to fly Vatican flags at a celebration of Diem's elder brother, a Catholic archbishop. Government troops opened fire on Buddhist protesters, killing and wounding dozens and triggering yet more protests. On June 10, 1963 correspondents were tipped that something important would happen the following day near the Cambodian embassy in Saigon, on the 11th photographer Malcolm Brown of the Associated Press captured two Buddhist monks, dousing an elderly comrade with gasoline as he sat lotus style. The monk Tiet Quang Duc then struck a match and dropped it on himself, and maintained his serenity while flames engulfed him. Brown's iconic photo of the event captivated the world. The Overthrow and Assassination of NGO Din Diem Vietnam and its ongoing mess entered America's national conversation, after the burning Buddhist photo appeared on the front page of newspapers across the U.S., as President Kennedy put it, no news picture in history has generated so much emotion around the world as that one. People questioned America's support for Diem's government, and Kennedy did not oppose a coup that overthrew it a few months later. On the night of November 1, 1963, units of the South Vietnamese Army attacked the presidential palace and captured it after a bloody siege. President Diem and his advisor and younger brother Ngo Dinh Nu surrendered after they were promised a safe exile. They were placed in the back of an armored personnel carrier that was to take them to a military airbase. Instead their captors decided that assassination was a better and more permanent solution. So the sibling were murdered by South Vietnamese officers en route to the airbase. The most famous assassin in the ancient world's most famous assassination. Marcus Junius Brutus is perhaps best known as the addressee of Julius Caesar's final words and lines, at two brute. From Shakespeare's play, Brutus was the Roman dictator's friend, the son of his longtime mistress, and the most famous of his assassins. Remarkably, Brutus' father had been betrayed and murdered by Caesar's rival, Pompey the Great. That did not stop Brutus from fighting Caesar under Pompey's command. Brutus was raised by his maternal uncle Cato the Younger, a conservative reactionary and Caesar's avowed enemy, Brutus had initially supported Caesar, but turned against him when he started viewing him as a would-be king. When Caesar marched into Italy in 49 BC, Brutus went against him and joined the ranks of his enemies, fighting under Pompey. However Caesar defeated Pompey at the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC. Brutus surrendered, and was pardoned and restored to favor. That did not stop him from continuing to resent Caesar, and he eventually joined an assassination plot to do away with him. The Assassination of Julius Caesar When a faction of Roman senators, styling themselves the Liberators, formed to plot the assassination of Julius Caesar, Brutus eagerly accepted the invitation to join them, he was a great symbolic catch, because he was a descendant of Lucius Licinius Brutus, the Roman Republic's founder, who had chased the last king out of Rome. On the Ides of March 44 BC, dozens of senators suddenly fell upon Caesar during a meeting of the Senate. Brutus stabbed the dictator in the groin, which contemporaries interpreted as a statement against his mother's former lover, as well as against the rumors that Caesar might have actually been Brutus' biological father. The assassins were pardoned by the Senate, but a riot soon thereafter forced them to flee Rome. The following year Mark Antony and Caesar's nephew and heir Octavius got that pardon revoked, and had the Senate declare the dictator's assassins murderers. Civil war erupted again, and ended with the assassins defeated at the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC. Brutus committed suicide, to avoid falling into Octavius' clutches. 20. Americans might do political assassinations, but we have never gone to the Dutch extremes of political assassination. Around the world, Americans have a reputation for violence, some of it deserved, some of it overblown, however bad as tempers have gotten in American politics, and one need only look at the news for the latest examples things have usually, if not always, stayed within reasonable. Every now and then tempers might get high enough in the U.S. for political violence to erupt. 
even on a massive scale such as that time in the 19th century, when Americans killed each other by the hundreds of thousands during the Civil War. Still bad as tempers have gotten in America, they never got so bad that American soldiers carried out an assassination of the head of government in the street, after which a frenzied mob seized the carcass, mutilated it then proceeded to cook and eat it, on that, the Dutch have us beat. Notwithstanding the Dutch reputation for orderliness and politeness, there was a time in 1672 when a Dutch mob went wild on their Prime Minister Johan de Witt.